There is no cap on the human mind. You are your own hero. You are your own leader. You are your own master. We are completely in control of our emotional state. You're going, this sucks, I, you know, but I'm gonna make the best of it. Small step, big priority. Small incremental changes. And no one saved me. You have to face yourself. I figured out the one piece I was missing. I thought it was cars. I thought it was women. I thought it was money. I thought it was everything. The one piece I was missing was me having the courage to face myself. I made this person. I made this person by diving in to the insecurities that life gave me. Because now they're yours. They're yours to own. If you're not smart, call yourself dumb. It's okay. If you're fat, call yourself fat. I used to be 300 pounds. Mm. We, we want to talk so soft to ourselves. We're looking for that recovery day. It's not coming. And that's the mentality I took with me. It wasn't like someone came down here and guided me through life. When you figure this out on your own, the amount of pride and dignity and self-respect you have, that's why I walk around the streets with a backpack <laughs> and just like, I don't need anything else. Yeah. You figure it out by going inside yourself, by callousing over the victim's mentality. So whether it's traffic or it's being in a horrific car accident, we are completely in control of our emotional state. And the, the, the key that unlocks the door to emotional invincibility, if you will, is acceptance. We can choose to be, consciously choose to be. First you accept what you can't change, and then you go, what emotion would best serve me? And I think more often than not, it's gratitude and happiness for the most part, or optimism, you know, as an emotion. But we can be the happiest and the most grateful we've ever been while we are going through the most difficult, painful, scary time in our lives. And, it's, and it doesn't, and here's the thing, it just makes it that much easier. It doesn't mean that it doesn't suck, but it means that you're not letting the fact that it sucks completely control your emotional well-being. You're going, this sucks, I, you know, but I'm gonna make the best of it. I think one of the biggest challenges with change is too much pressure, especially when someone has other challenges that affect the challenge of distraction. And I would look at small incremental changes. Small changes, but a big priority in their life. The challenge I find is that too many of us are trying to change too many things all at the same time. It's like we want to wake up early and start going to the gym and eat right all in the same week. It's impossible. Right? It's impossible. It's impossible. Like, no one can do that. Small step, big priority. Try and change one small thing, but make it the biggest priority of the week. What we do, we try and make big steps and make them all small priorities. Um. And so we want to shift that. Right, shift it the other way around. If you see a child, a child doesn't start learning how to eat proper food and walk at the same time. Like children have moments in their life where certain things start evolving for them. That's how we're built, that's how we're wired. So allowing that to happen continuously, mm. even when we grow older, makes it easier for that person as well. Fear is so real, in fact, there are probably things that you're afraid of doing right now in your life, in your relationships, at work. And the fact that you're afraid, that's robbing you of all of the experiences that you wanna have in your life. I mean, if you're afraid to fly, that's gonna limit your ability to travel and see the world or go visit friends. If you're afraid of public speaking, that's gonna really limit your ability to express yourself and share your ideas. If, you, if you're afraid of talking to your boss or asking for a raise, that directly impacts how much money you make. Or what if you are dreaming of starting a business or you've already started a new business, but you're afraid to talk to people and you're afraid to share your business with people? I mean, fear is something that stops us all. Fear is real. You can't control the feelings that are gonna rise up in your body when you're on a plane or when you're talking to your boss or when you see somebody that's attractive and you, you really wanna go over and, and talk to that person. But you can always control what you think and you can always make a decision about the actions you're gonna take. But the thing that's so difficult for most of us is how when you're alone, you push through the excuses, the habits, the fears, and actual physical constraints that you have in your life right now so that you can make the pivot. What do you do when you have to get on a plane and you're actually terrified of flying? What do you do if you gotta give a presentation and you are afraid of public speaking? 
here's what you're gonna do. Think about your brain as being in two modes. There's autopilot, and we've all experienced that. Well, what is autopilot? Autopilot is the interior part of your brain. You'll hear neuroscientists and psychologists talk about the basal ganglia. Very important thing to understand is that there's a part of your brain that its entire job is basically to execute your habits. Habits, behaviors that you repeat without even thinking about it. When you pull your pants on in the morning, I guarantee you, you either put your left or your right leg in first. Because that behavior is what researchers call a habit loop. It gets encoded as a closed loop system right here. The problem for most of us is that half of the day, we're on autopilot. And that's not me making a guess, that's what researchers that study habits and study psychology say. That half of your day, you're basically kind of checked out and you're on autopilot. And when you're checked out and you're on autopilot, any behavior pattern that you repeat can take over. And guess what are behavior patterns that we repeat? Thinking patterns. So self-doubt, worry, procrastination, overthinking, analysis paralysis, fear. Those are all thinking patterns that are habits. One of the most important things that I want people to understand is that you're actually not a worrier. You have a habit of worry. You're not a procrastinator. You have a habit of procrastinating. Big difference. And when you understand that any behavior pattern, whether it is a thinking pattern, like you doubt yourself all the time, or whether it's a behavior pattern, like you drink too much, or you snap at your kids, or you micromanage your team, every one of those behavior patterns and thinking patterns can actually be interrupted and replaced using science. Now, let's talk about the second part of the brain, drive. Drive is the mode where you're in charge of your thoughts. It's where you are fully awake, you are present, and you are driving your thoughts and actions. When you're doing that, your prefrontal cortex is active. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that you need in order to learn new behavior, in order to do something difficult, in order to do something uncertain, in order to do strategic thinking, and now you got a decision to make. Are you going to drift back into the habits or are you going to awaken your prefrontal cortex and drive forward and focus and do something new? You have to act within five seconds. Are you going to go on autopilot and get trapped in your mind? Or are you going to five, four, three, two, one and awaken your prefrontal cortex and drive forward? You think that you need to feel confident or courageous in order to get started. You don't. You actually just have to start, and that's the riddle of life. That lying in bed, hoping that you wake up some morning motivated to change, that's not the answer. You actually have to learn how to push yourself. You have to learn how to, how to leverage the power of your decisions, and you've got to learn how to take action when you don't feel like it. Because every morning when I woke up, I did not feel confident. I felt like a loser. I felt like the world's worst parent. I felt like I had failed at every single turn. See, this is the knowledge action gap. You can know what you want. You can know what you should be doing. But how do you make yourself do it when the feelings and the motivation isn't there? When all you got is fear. You cannot control what triggers you and the fact that you may rise up with anger. You may rise up with self-doubt. You may have anxiety. Fill your body. But you can always control what you think and how you behave. And we spend way too much time trying to focus on manipulating how we feel about things and not enough time practicing the skills of controlling your behavior and your thoughts. We make decisions with feelings. 95% of our decisions are made by how you feel in the moment. And that is the problem. You need to take control of the moment and leverage the power of your decisions and make them up here. Because when I was lying in bed, I wasn't saying to myself, I should get up because that's gonna help me start my day right. I was saying, do I feel like getting up? Do you feel like making that cold call? No, you don't. Do you feel like doing that third set of reps? No, you don't. Do you feel like having that hard conversation? No, you don't. Do you feel like ending this relationship, whether it's in business or in your life, that is sucking you dry? No, you don't. We make decisions based on our feelings, and that is robbing you of joy and opportunity. 
and it is blinding you from the fact that how you change your life is one five second decision at a time, one push at a time. And if you if you accept the fact that you may never feel ready and you may never feel motivated and you may never feel confident, you may never feel courageous and that's okay, but you can still push yourself forward. What happens over time is as you start to see yourself becoming the person that takes action, that you start to see yourself becoming the kind of person that speaks even though your voice is shaking. You're the kind of person that, that, that has a bias toward moving instead of a bias toward thinking. Guess what happens? You build the skill of confidence and courage. Five years ago, we thought the brain stopped growing at the age of 25. The answer now is never. The truth is your brain's always growing and expanding. That's why you can always learn new things, which is amazing because it allows for what we call behavioral flexibility, meaning there's no reason for you to ever be stagnant, not in business, not as a leader, not as a human being. What's the point, man? Why am I doing all this? Is it really worth it? Because I've been working so hard, man, and for so many years, let me just be real, I, I can't help but feel like I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not getting the results that I should be. And everyone else, they've got what they want. The money, the job, the life, they're traveling the world. They're getting what they want. And I'm just like, here. No one sees what I'm meant to be. And I don't care what you think, but the honest truth, the honest truth, what I really feel is, it's unfair, man. I deserve more. Why am I not getting it? Is it something I didn't do? Is it me? Is it something I did wrong? Because I put the hours of work in. I even put money into this, effort into this. And here I am. The date has changed, but my life hasn't. I haven't. Why am I still here? I just, I don't get it, man. I, what am I doing wrong? Maybe I'm not that talented. Maybe, maybe they're right. And this has all been a waste of time. Because the dream I was sold, it's become a nightmare. You've got to stop comparing yourself. Everything has its time. I know you're not where you want to be yet. But that's okay. The damage that's been done, it's because we compare other people's highlight reels to our behind the scenes. This world, it doesn't give you what you want. It gives you the lesson you need. We want all the riches and glamour in the world using just a few small hacks. We want to be seen only for our best bits while hiding our worst flaws but not everything that glitters is gold. What we need, what you need, is to compare where you are with what you were, to compare where we are with what we already have. So just work with what you have. Be patient. Start wherever you are and do the best with what you have. Cause someone out there tonight is praying for the things you take for granted every night. So just stop and write it out. Count what you have, not what you don't. So don't worry if on this journey you're not where you were meant to be. There's no hurry. After all, the fruit is the last part to grow on a tree. Good things don't just fall into your lap. The opportunity comes to those who are always on the attack. So attack, live what you dream, work for what you dream, and do your best, always. Just keep on keeping on. And remember, there's no such thing as a life that's better than yours. Peace. Self-mastery, power begins from within. If you're aware of who you are, if you're aware of what you're good at, what you're not good at, if you're able to see how emotions kind of govern your life, 
If you can learn what your weaknesses are and how to control them, you can't ever get complete control, but awareness is almost enough. Slowly through this process of knowing who you are and understanding other people and how they operate so you don't make stupid mistakes in life, you can increase that little tiny margin more and more and more and you will be a person of power. We try so hard in our lives to fit in. We try to fit into certain groups, certain frats, certain sororities, you know, among certain friends, yet the people we idolize are most are the ones that stand out. But when you're prepared, there is no fear. There is no fear of failure. Because even if you've walked out of something and you feel like you failed at it, your preparation is so strong that you're gonna take that failure and turn it into the outcome you desire. And most people stop at failure. We've all failed at things. I'm gonna to continue to fail at stuff. It's the most powerful tool you can use, but it all depends on how you use it. A scalpel in the hands of an individual, it can do unbelievable damage. In the hands of a professional, of a doctor, it saves lives. So it's the same thing with failure. It's how you use it. It's that drive inside of you. It's what we talk about, the dark side. The dark side is filled with failure, but it's the fuel that burns you like something that's never burned inside you before. And on some days, you gotta just listen to your soul. And you gotta say, I'm gonna leap, I'm gonna get to the edge. Most people are at the edge, and you're standing at the edge, and you're watching everyone else fly. That's pimp my ride, watch my crib, all this stuff. You know, watching people's lives on Facebook. You're at the edge, watching someone else live, wondering what it's gonna be like when you jump without ever jumping. And I'm just here to tell you, jump. Because only three things can happen. You're either gonna jump and fly, or you're gonna jump and fall on something soft. Are you gonna fall down hard? Either way, you're gonna get back up. You already know you got what it takes to get back up. Your greatest fear is not that you will fall. Your greatest fear is that you will live a full life and never fly. That you never leaped. You're not afraid of dying. You're afraid of dying before the world sees who you really are. Before they really get your fingerprint. Before they really get your contribution. Before they really feel you. That's what you don't want to happen. You don't want to leave this place without us knowing you were here. There's a process. The process begins by first knowing what you really love. And believe me, a lot of people have no self-awareness. They don't even really know what it is that they were meant to do in life. They loved music when they were a kid, but then they got into law or whatever because of their parents, and then they don't know who they are anymore. Well, do I really like music? You gotta go through that process first of figuring out what it is that really connects to you in a deep visceral way, what you loved when you were a kid, what still excites you. Once you go through that and you understand it and you've got some clarity about it, okay, how do I incorporate that in my life? I know it's hard sometimes. I know you feel lost, confused, and hurt sometimes. But what if you tried to be nothing more than to be beautifully broken? To fall again and again in your imperfect, flawed, lost confusion as you try to find your way. When I first saw Avicii on stage, I would have done anything to be him. He must be the happiest man on earth, I said. He had it all. The travel, the lifestyle, performing to thousands, the success. But things aren't always what they seem. Success, money, travel, and even a smile doesn't mean happiness. And the face we show the world is often just the best mask that we could find to get through the day. We're following some sad news from the music world. EDM star Avicii has died. He was found dead in the city of Muscat, Oman. You gotta keep going. You have to keep moving. You have to keep evolving. You have to keep loving. Because all the darkness in the world isn't enough to distinguish one small, tiny speck of light. But one tiny speck is enough to make everything else around you more bright. When I first saw Robin Williams, I thought he was the funniest person on earth. He made me laugh hysterically. The type of person that must always be joking, laughing and happy. The characters, the movies, the stand-up comedy, he was the best. But mental illness doesn't care how successful you are, and being funny isn't the same as being happy. For Robin Williams, comedy was the wall he built to hide his darkness, the mask he wore to make everybody else's day. So, um, I hate to have to report this. Every idea of who you are, let go of it. 
There's nothing fixed about who or what you can be. Like I said, they're all just stories thread together by the inaccurate dead memories of the past. You are a real force of nature, a force of nature. Think about what that means. You have a power innate to you that can't be bought, taught or replicated, only remembered. Like a planet brings satellites into orbit. Have faith in your force of nature. It's magnetic, effortless, and it can't be turned on or off. People have survived slavery, people have survived concentration camps and still found meaning. People have survived heartbreak, loss, death, grief, sadness, betrayal, confusion, all these things for years. When we see a sign on a car that says baby on board or handicapped driver, naturally we're more patient with the driver. We slow down and give them space to drive because we know there's a vulnerable person inside. Would we be so considerate if the sign wasn't there? I can almost definitely say no. The truth is we don't know what people are going through because people don't wear signs to illustrate their struggles. You don't see a sign attached to somebody saying I'm going through a divorce or I've lost a child or I'm feeling depressed or I've been diagnosed with cancer. If we could visually see what those around us were going through, we would definitely be kinder. We're all connected, we're all together in this. At the reduction of our identities of self lies real unity. So trust me, you will find a way they can't ever stop you. You will seep through every crack, grow around every obstacle, rise to every challenge because you are that and that is you. Pain is relative and everybody around you is going through their own pain and it's a pain we know nothing about. A pain that's often masked with a smile to protect the vulnerable person inside. Whether we know what's going on or not, we have to treat everybody as if they're wearing a sign that we can't see. Mental health issues are invisible illnesses that don't always look the same from the outside. You can have everything in the world but still be unhappy. And that's not because you're hard to please or you're just never satisfied, it's because pain, sadness and depression do not discriminate. We often make the mistake of thinking the answer to our happiness lies in having the life of somebody else without realizing that many of the people we wish we were are going through struggles so painful that they wish they were someone else too. Not all shared subjective reality is true. So what I write about in my book is how to study the culture scape, the shared subjective realities we are living in and identify what rules help you and what rules are really rules or bullshit rules. Rules that hold you back from truly living your most extraordinary life. So let me give you an example of a bullshit rule. Growing up in an Indian family, there's a lot of pressure to be successful. Your family pushes you to be a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer. And if you're not any of that, you're a family embarrassment. So in my case, I loved art. I viewed artists, the idea of me being an artist, as disappointing my family, as the opposite of success. So I signed up for computer engineering classes. I studied hard, went through all of these boring as hell classes that I had no interest in at the University of Michigan, so that five years later, I could get a job at Microsoft. And now, boom, I was it. I was working for Bill Gates. I was at Microsoft. 11 weeks into Microsoft, I realized I was miserable, and I quit cold turkey. I realized that for five years, I was pursuing something that I had no interest in because the rules of the culture scape of being a good Indian kid said, be a software programmer. So I quit. I quit, I went, I joined a nonprofit, and that's really when my life began. I dabbled in different things from, from traveling around the world to meditation, to art, but it was through following these passions, it was through ignoring the bullshit rules of the culture scape, identifying what really drove me, what made me passionate, that I was able to build the life I have today. And that's really why I'm so adamant about teaching people through my work to question everything, to question your religion, to question your societal rules, to question the idea of a college degree. That's how I feel all of us should be living life, by questioning everything. And I don't mean being skeptical of everything, there's a difference. I mean healthy skepticism, ultimately questioning the rules of the culture scape so we can stay true to our own inner identity. I think the idea of goal setting in the Western world is rubbish. Because here's what happened. When you ask people to set goals, even if you teach them methodologies like SMART, SMART, SMART goal setting, 
you are basically encouraging people to set goals based on that same culture scape with its restricting rules. So people, especially in the United States, set goals along the lines of this. Okay, we need to get good grades so I can graduate high school, so I can get into a good college, need to study hard to get a good GPA, so maybe I can go to graduate school, or maybe I can do well in my LSAT, that becomes the next goal, get into law school, the next goal, graduate from law school, get into a partnership, become a lawyer. And that's how teenagers often think about their life, these series of like ticks that they have to go through. But here's what happens. Let's actually look at that. Let's look at lawyers. 50% of lawyers in America are clinically depressed. It's not just the US, I think Australia did a similar study. So why are kids going into these professions where they end up in, in a job that they thought was a good goal at one point, only to find themselves absolutely miserable? We set our goals to have two cars and a house of a certain size, to be in a marriage. It's because these goals aren't coming from inside us. They're coming from the culture scape. And the culture scape is basically a safety net mechanism. You see, for the longest time in human history, we had to watch out for each other. There were wars, there were disease. Go back a thousand years, there were wild animals that might kill you. So you had to follow certain rules of the culture scape to stay safe. Among these were get a good education, so you are not stuck in a factory job so that you can have a blue collar job. It was get married, so if you're a woman, you have a man to provide for you. It was have five kids, because you know, if you go back 50 years ago, um, infant mortality was so much higher. You had five kids, two were gonna probably pass away. But the problem is, people continue with these same rules in today's world when everything has changed. So the thing is, I don't believe in goal setting because when you teach traditional goal setting, people are locked into the rules of the culture scape. So here's what I suggest. I suggest we ask ourselves three questions and I call these the three most important questions. Now the first question is this, it's what experiences do I wanna have? Okay, now I'll tell you why that's important. You see, there are two types of goals. There are means goals and there are end goals. So people tend to chase means goals, not realizing these are very different from end goals. A means goal is do well in my LSAT, graduate from college, get that particular job, save up for retirement. But if you ask these people, why do you want that? There's always a so. Well, I wanna qualify for college, so I can do this. Wanna become a lawyer, so I can do this. Well, the so leads you to the end goal. Now, what are end goals? End goals are these things that really lead to the, the beauty of being human. It's waking up next to someone you madly love. It's holding your first child in your arms. It's having a puppy. It's seeing your business open for the first time. It's making that, you know, getting that first customer. It's completing your first book. It's creating a work of art and having people admire it and fall in love with it. These are end goals. So what I advocate is, and the three most important question is, Forget the means goals. Means goals are goals designed by the culture scape. Instead, go straight to the end goals. Now the first question you ask yourself to identify your end goals is what experiences do I wanna have in life? And this is where you start writing down your experiences. You know, when I do this exercise, I ask people to take out a piece of paper. So if you're watching, do that right now. Take out a piece of paper, three columns. Top of the first column, you're gonna write down experiences, right? And ask yourself, what experiences do I wanna have? Who do I wanna wake up with? What type of house do I wanna live in? What countries do I wanna visit? Where do I wanna to travel to? What adventures do I wanna have? Whether it's climbing Mount Kinabalu or hiking the Andes. What type of family life do I want? What dog do I want? The beautiful thing about experiences is often they don't require that much money. It's crazy, we associate money with happiness, but often the most beautiful experiences in life require no money. Almost any human being today can fall in love, Can make a baby. These are some of the most profound experiences I've had. So the first thing is you make a list of your experiences. Now the second thing is you ask yourself this question. For me to be the man or woman who has all of these experiences, how do I have to grow? And here we come to the second list. See, I believe we are souls having a human experience here on planet Earth. But these souls are not just here to explore all of these wonderful things about being human. I believe as, as souls, as human beings, we crave growth. Human beings are growth-driven machines. And so you make that second list. And that second list is, how do I want to grow? How can I learn to be a better father, a better spouse, a better lover? What languages do you want to learn? Do you want to learn a musical instrument? Do you want to learn to write? Do you want to learn to play a particular sport or learn a particular skill? What many people don't realize about the world is that growth 
is a goal in itself. It's one of the key things that drive us forward as human beings, but very few people write down growth as goals. It's because the education system, which tries to teach us to grow through forced learning, makes many people dread learning. So growth becomes that second list. Now you have two lists, your experiences and your growth. Now you ask yourself the third question, and the third question is this, to be that man or woman, who has all of these experiences, to be that man or woman who has grown in such a way, how can I give back to the world? And there's a very important reason for that question. The Dalai Lama said, if you want to be happy, make other people happy. And I believe that when you do these three most important questions, that third category is what truly leads to fulfillment. It's when you can take your growth, you can take your experiences and contribute to fellow souls, to contribute to the human race. You've learned entrepreneurship, great, mentor someone, mentor a kid who wants to get there. You have the ability to sing, figure out how to use it to deliver you know, beautiful music, to inspire people. So your list of contributions becomes your steps for you to give back to the world because that takes you beyond pure happiness into fulfillment. Now when you have this list, experiences, growth and contribution, this becomes your goal list. Everything else is just a means goal. Now when I started creating this, I found that it allowed me to rewire my brain, to shortcut and bypass so many bullshit rules to go straight to these final items, to go straight to ways I could contribute, ways I could grow, ways I could have these beautiful experiences. And often these were unconventional parts. When you have done the three most important questions, you get to short circuit the rules of the culture scheme and figure out shorter parts towards true human fulfillment. Everyone has got three things wrong. The number one is I'm not enough. The second one is I'm different, so I can't connect. And the third is I really want something like freedom from depression or success, but it's not available. But I'm not enough is the biggest. Mm. And if we look at the key addictions, shopping, binging on food, binging on alcohol, binging sex, on drugs, porn. sex, sex especially, Food. porn, all of those things come from a feeling of emptiness inside because we're taught, oh, you feel a feeling? Why don't you eat some donuts or go mm -hmm. onto eBay and buy, or Amazon or buy drink something or have a drink. And our feelings are the most real thing we have. And we push them down. We find all this stuff to buy or eat or drink or take to keep us, like John Lennon said, comfortably numb. Mm. But then the feelings regroup and come back because they've always got a job to do. Look, you've got to feel the feeling until it no longer requires to be felt. You can't eat it or drink it or shop it away, but we're all taught that we can and should. It starts with yourself, man. You gotta start diving into those things that you are afraid of. You don't gain confidence by going to the spot that makes you feel good. What gives you confidence is not being afraid. It's overcoming the fear. Maybe not overcoming them every day, but facing them and facing them and facing them. Pretty soon like this, you know what, man, this is where it's at. It's not in that comfort zone. It's in the discomfort zone is where my confidence is getting built. Mm -hmm. That's where it's getting built. But people want to, they want an easier answer. Yeah. There has to be an easier way. There's not. You have to face yourself. So many people live to be 100 years old and they die miserable having everything because they never examined. I call it my live autopsy. You never examine this. Happiness, peace, enlightenment, it's all up here, man. Everybody's got a story. We don't share it on social media. We share our nice life on social media. We, have, we all have a dungeon. Mental toughness isn't something that you sample. It's something that you live in every day. Whenever hardness comes, and you know what it is, it may be different for you than it is for me, but you go back to your insecurities. And then when you go back to your insecurities, you then look for comfort within those insecurities. And we all look for that cookie that your mom used to give you right. when you were sad, yeah. when you were sick. 
We look for our wife or our husband. We look for comfort. It's in those moments you must retrain your mind.